US jobs growth is revised down, cementing rate cut bets and sending the world's reserve currency down even more. Thailand and Indonesia hold rates, and Japan's export data indicates some weakness in global demand. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, analyzes how Australia is tracking for a soft economic landing after such a rapid rise in interest rates. Of course, we're not there yet. We still have to actually land this plane, and we're not in the process of landing it yet. But it does look like the soft landing remains in prospect, at least in Australia's case. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, the US dollar index was down another 0.3% as of 4am Sydney Melbourne time, and the yields on US Treasuries fell by 4 to 8 basis points. That was after data revisions showed 818,000 fewer jobs were added in the year to March than previously thought. The S&P 500 was up 0.3% as traders all but cemented bets the Federal Reserve will cut rates from September. Now, the Fed's rate cut cycle looms large for rate decisions of several Asian central banks, particularly those worried about currency weakness. We have three this week. Here's ANZ economist Crystal Tan on Bank Indonesia's decision yesterday to hold rates at 6.25%. It also flagged that global developments do still warrant vigilance, including risks related to a potential U.S. recession and also geopolitical dynamics. Now, the governor did reiterate scope for a policy rate cut in Q4 this year, and it flagged that its focus in Q3 is still on strengthening the rupiah. So overall, we are still keeping our focus for at least one 25 basis point rate cut by Q4, likely in October. So that would follow uh, the U.S. Fed's pivot in September. Weaker US dollars saw the Aussie dollar up 0.19% at 67.53 US cents at 4am Sydney Melbourne time, and the Kiwi was up 0.29% at 61.7 US cents. Number two, the Bank of Thailand at the same time held rates steady at 2.5%, with just one of the seven policymakers voting for a cut. It was the same as the last decision. Here's Crystal again. What did change, though, was the overall tone of the policy statement. It does seem a bit more cautious than before, uh, mainly on two fronts. First, the BOT now highlighted the need to monitor downside risks to private demand. And two, it also assessed that financial conditions have tightened. So this could weigh on credit quality and the credit cycle as a result. Number three, attention in the Asia-Pacific now turns to a rate decision on South Korea today. Or more importantly, the signalling that might accompany an expected hold at 3.5%. But they will stand more dovish signals, either through its uh, forward guidance in terms of the number of members that will signal an openness to rate cuts in the three-month horizon. And we also see scope for a potential minority opinion for an outright cut at the meeting today. Number four, in Japan, the yen has recovered in the past month against that weaker US dollar. But until last month, a weaker currency had helped lift exports 10 0.3% in July from a year ago, backed by demand for cars and chip parts. ANZ FX analyst Felix Ryan says, though, there was a 5.2% fall in export volumes, even though values rose 10.3%. And that fall in volumes does point to global economic headwinds. We saw export volumes to China down about 11% year over year in July and uh, export volumes to Europe also down about 14% too. Uh, Even the US, that was down 5% uh, on this front too. So certainly a bit of a weakness on the global demand side of things maybe acts as a bit of a headwind at the margin to Japan's economic recovery. But that's particularly more so for the manufacturing side of things. Number five. To Australia now, where this week's ANZ Roy Morgan consumer confidence measure saw inflation expectations at a a two-and-a-half-year low. Headline confidence dipped very slightly, but as ANZ economist Maddie Dunk explains, there are signs of households feeling a boost from those stage three tax cuts. If I look at the broader picture over the last month and a half, consumer confidence is up four points. And in particular, what we're seeing is that household confidence in their current financial conditions is up almost 10 points relative to the first week of July. So it does suggest that those tax cuts are having some impact on how households are feeling. Maddie Dunk there. Now, in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Head of Australian Economics, Adam Boyton, looks at how the Australian economy, supported by those tax cuts, is heading towards a soft landing after so many rate hikes. 
It's probably a bit early for people to declare mission accomplished, but when you think about it, one of the fastest rises in interest rates seen in recent history after one of the greatest shocks to the global supply chain. And yet Australia really hasn't had much of a recession. Asset prices have just kept on rising. And it looks like a soft landing is in prospect. Our forecasts certainly do point to a soft landing. Probably the most interesting thing, or one of the most interesting things about this cycle is how resilient economies ended up being to higher interest rates. Certainly that's that's the case. We did, of course, and we do see it really clearly, the impact of higher interest rates. That is, we see that really clearly in the weakness in consumer confidence over the past eight, eight months, the weakness in household incomes that certainly was a feature of the economy over 2023 and into early 2024. Though that weakness in household incomes, though, should start to dissipate as the uh, the stage three tax cuts and cost of living relief measures land. And to give you a, a sense of that, our expectation is that after inflation, household incomes will be growing at about four and a half percent come the middle of 2025, which is a reasonably rapid clip. Things then cool down a little bit, but it's probably fair to say for the household sector in aggregate, as we move into the second half of this year, some of those constraints and pressures on household sector cash flows will start to ease a bit. For those who might remember the recession of the early 90s, this is quite a good bounce back really. Do you think it was the strength of household balance sheets and corporate balance sheets that was the difference this time around? There have probably been a number of factors that have helped not just the Australian economy, but economies around the globe, whether interest rate increases over the past few years. The first is balance sheets were certainly in a much better shape after that long period of balance sheet repair following the global financial crisis. Secondly, there was a pent up stock of savings the household sector had access to. In many cases, those excess savings are yet to be spent. It's also quite possible that the extraordinary fiscal stimulus we saw through the pandemic, I should say, gave the global economy a real shot in the arm that sort of got rid, if you will, of of some of the softness we'd seen globally in wages growth and some of the sluggishness in economic activity, which had been a bit of a feature, certainly in the Australian economy pre-pandemic. And so I think there's probably a whole range of things that have come together, but it certainly would be a remarkable achievement if central banks are able to have tamed this inflation shock with unemployment rates ending only a little higher in most cases than where you might think full employment is, which is really quite an impressive achievement. Of course, we're not there yet, as you say, Bernard. We still have to actually um, land this plane and we're not in the process of landing it yet, but it does look like the soft landing remains in prospect, at least in Australia's case. Adam Boyton there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Thursday, August the 22nd. Catch you tomorrow with news of what those PMIs across major developed economies are telling us about the global economic backdrop. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.